My presentation is entitled The Continuing Peace Process in the Philippines. Another subtitle would be The Enduring, as if it's forever. It's been happening for such a long time already. Challenges to a negotiated political settlement to arm internal conflicts. Much of the military budget, much of the resources of the armed forces of the Philippines have been poured not into national defense, but rather internal security issues or inter internal armed conflicts. This is the outline of my presentation. First, I would like to give you a broad overview of the Philippines and the roots of conflict. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Napisa. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Uh, then I will discuss the, the two remaining internal armed conflicts. We've had many, and uh, we've had minor armed conflicts that have been settled already. But the two enduring armed conflicts are one, the communist insurgency. Second, the separatist movements in southern Philippines, just like in Thailand, the problem with southern Thailand. Yes. Then I would like to, being a political scientist and a social scientist, sometimes we're so obsessed with frameworks <laughs> and models. So I would like to give you the analytical frame that I will be using. Uh, discussion of the peace process in the Philippines. Uh, we'll be using the state in society framework by Joel Mendel, a very uh, famous uh, political scientist. And then I will also adopt the political opportunity structure, which is actually uh, from the literature on contentious politics. Uh, popularized by uh, the late Charles Tilly and uh, his protege Cindy Carroll, who are political sociologists. And then some possible outcomes of various combination of variables with regard to the peace process. And then a brief overview of the negotiations with the Communist Party of the Philippines it's now, I think, the only surviving Maoist insurgency in the world, aside from Colombia. Colombia. So Colombia still has, or at least in this side of the world. Okay. How about Nepal? Nepal. Okay, so three. So you have Philippines, Colombia, and India also. India also. Four. Any more? <laughs> Any more Maoist insurgents here around here? Okay. So, four. We saved four or five. Okay. But at least in Southeast Asia, it's the last remaining <laughs> that's limiting the, the slope. So we can say that we are the last remaining Maoist insurgents in this part, in this corner of the world. And then we have the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Uh, and then some lessons and recommendations. Now, here's the map of the conflict in the Philippines. Uh, the difference between the two is that for the communist insurgency, it's all over the archipelago. And from north to south, uh, there is a presence of uh, communist guerrilla fronts fighting the government for the Philippine state. For the separatist movement, it is limited to Mindanao particularly in Muslim Mindanao. Uh, so that's the difference. Of course, uh, there have been uh, attacks by Emayale in the nation's capital of Manila. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a result of bringing the war to the center of power. Now, What's the root of all of these conflicts, uh, or the roots of the conflict, both uh, with the communist insurgency and with Mindanao? 
Well, the primary factor, of course, if you will uh, study Philippine history, Philippine politics, are the colonial legacies. Uh, you see the number 377, 52, and 3. That's 377 years of Spanish colonial rule and 52 years of American rule and three years of Japanese occupation. Or, as I would describe it usually with my students, uh, it's 300, almost 400 years in the convent, 50 years in Hollywood, and three years of eating sushi. <laughs> Now, if any country experience or go through that kind of, uh, of uh, colonial rule or domination, of course, it will have a profound effect on the institutions of that society of that country. And indeed, it has affected uh, the institutions in the Philippine state. Unlike the process of state building in, let's say, Japan, in which uh, during the time of the Meiji Restoration, the elites of Japan put it upon themselves to strengthen the Japanese state by strengthening the central bureaucracy and building a strong army and police force. Or even in Thailand, under the reign of uh, King Chumulongkorn, uh, the attempt to modernize Siam into a modern state included building up a uh, strong democracy. In the Philippines, the opposite happened. What the colonizers did, and this is similar to what they have done in Latin America, is to rule by proxy. So what they do is they identify the notables, the elites of each province, each municipality, each town. And then they appoint these uh, members of the local elites. And they rule by remote control from the center. So this has resulted in a state building trajectory or a state building process in which you have a weak central state and you have several autonomous powers. Given the duty of extracting resources from the local population. And through time, even if we have developed a Western style presidential form of government, it was built on this infrastructure of a weak central state and strong autonomous local powers. And somehow, this has empowered not the state, this has empowered not the market, but this has empowered local warlords and bosses, who eventually monopolize the local political economy, first through control of land, then later on, with other business opportunities that come along the way. On top of that, they ran for public office after independence, <coughs> and they have captured all elected local positions, and then, not satisfied with that, they also run for national office, and then they start replicating reproducing and bequeathing the elected and appointed power to their children, thus establishing political dynasties. So what we have is a system of democracy, but democracy in name, just like Thailand. <laughs> Am I supposed to say that? Yeah. Okay. So it's a formal democracy. It's a democracy in form but not in substance. Because real power is not in the hands of the people electing their representatives. It's in the hands of a few elite who 
controls both economic and social power. And did you know that the Philippine legislature, which is the nexus of both national and local power, since 1907, when the first, or even earlier, when the first uh, members of the national legislature was elected, since the 1900s, one fourth of all elected legislators are members of what we call political clans or political clans. So, out of the roughly 2,500 plus representatives, members of the legislature that were elected, a fifth of that are members of political clans. So, that already gives us an idea of the kind of institutions that we have in the Philippines. And the other legacy of colonial rule is that of a neo-colonial independent economy. So, of course, just like some countries in Latin America, Africa, and even this parts of Asia, uh, Former colonies, after they're given, quote unquote, their independence, are not really independent because somehow their economy is tied to the entire neo colonial setup. So, this has affected the Philippines in such a way that for the longest time, the focus was on export agriculture, particularly of rice, sugar, and coconut. And of course, in a, in a system in which the institutional setup favors the elite, both in terms of political and economic power, the opportunity of this trade relation between the former colony, the U.S., and that of the Philippines, did not benefit the farmers, but rather the elite land holding families. And if you know your basic political economy, the trajectory of development should be after agriculture comes industrialization, right? So in stages of economic growth and development, modernity is measured if your economy is successfully hurdled from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. That did not happen in the Philippines. Why? Because the capitalist class that was supposed to emerge from, from the old agriculture economy, the capitalists actually were the former landowners. So in theory, capitalism should erase feudalism with the emergence of a new entrepreneurial class, the capitalists. But what happened in the Philippines? The landowners transformed themselves into being the capitalists. <laughs> so now they, they control both the land and all the entrepreneurial opportunities in the emerging markets of the Philippines. And to protect that, they participate in politics. Or they feel friendly politicians who will protect. So, what are the social institutional costs of this setup? If you're the common Filipino, if you're the common man or woman, through centuries, the system did not work for you. It always worked for somebody else. First the Spaniards, and the Americans, then Japanese, and then when you finally got your independence, no, it's more politicians stealing and robbing in line. So, in terms of culture, definitely, instead of going towards the state, instead of feeling that you are a citizen of the state, instead of having a high identification with a nation, you would identify with your family with your province mate, with your neighbors, right? 
So the social cause of this is a low social cohesion and in using uh, Benedict Anderson's famous description of nationhood, a low level of imagination. So the Filipinos have this, they think of themselves first as from a Tagalog or a Bisaya, these are different parts of the country, instead of thinking of themselves as Filipinos. The only time that we feel that we are Filipinos is when we are abroad. When we are outside the country, that's when we cry, when we hear Filipino songs. <laughs> that's when we miss our Filipino food. But what's for, and whenever we're abroad, we follow the rules. <laughs> but once we're back, uh, we're back in Manila. <laughs> it's organized chaos again. <laughs> so, all of these are part of the colonial legacies. And in social science, in political science, this is what we call historical institutional analysis. And this is what we call the process of path dependency. The first choice is always important. And this is also true for our personal lives. Right? Oh, I should have not made that choice. And now I'm stuck. So that's the same uh, problem we are facing. Uh, especially with institutions. Institutional choices are part of the rules of the game. How we should do particular things. So if we decide that this is how it should be done, we should stick with it. And once we stick with it through time, it will harden. And it would be costly to change back, to change direction. So, the problem in the Philippines is indeed tremendous in the sense that we are not just uh, facing present problems, present issues. We are facing historical problems. And that is the background of the conflict happening in my country. Because all of this has resulted in what we call elite democracy, not genuine representative or even participatory democracy. We are a democracy in name, but not in substance. And the Philippines, just like Thailand and Indonesia, takes pride takes pride in being the democratic countries in Southeast Asia. The others have no qualms, no pretensions in saying that they are truly, genuinely democratic. And I will not make names in the spirit of ASEAN. Okay? I'm not as brave as Dr. Nalisa. So, but, yeah, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, we take pride with the fact that we are democratic. But we are democratic in name. Because there's still a problem regarding what we term as elite democracy. Another problem that the Philippines face is that because of weak systems, weak institutions, we've gone through a cycle of economic boom and bust. It's a continuing. So we thought in the 1950s we will be, you know, the industrial, the industrialized nation in Asia. In the 1950s, the Philippines was second only to Japan. And now we're almost, what, second to Laos? I hope not. No offense to Laos, of course. So, uh, and then, aside from the cycle of boom and bust, Dr. Sue would know this, Ben Sue, because he worked with the Asian Development Bank in Manila for such a long time. So, the, the cycle of economic boom and bust, that we were almost there, but not yet. The tape, 
we are about to take off, but oops, no gas. <laughs> so that's the problem with the Philippines. And then, as a result of this inability to make that giant leap towards development, we also suffer from a cycle of political development and underdevelopment. So we, there are times that we are proud of our democracy, and there are times that we are a bit ashamed. So, and one of the times or the moments or the period in our history that we were ashamed of our system was uh, during the time of the Marcos dictatorship. Ferdinand Marcos started as a Democrat. Not a Democrat, Democrat, but he was Democratic. He was popularly elected. He was actually a war hero. He's one of the most brilliant politicians ever born in the Philippines. He was charismatic, he was a good orator, and he had a beautiful wife, <laughs> Imelda. So in 1965, he was elected. They charmed the Filipino voters. They were actually the JFK and Jacqueline of the Philippines. And they were building their own version of Canada. Until he ran for re-election in 1969. So the first eight years of the Marcos administration was really good until he declared martial law in 1972. And he stayed on in power for 14 more years. On, of course, uh, the pretext that he will save democracy and he will make the nation great. But as a result, we lost 14 years to crony capitalism and corruption and, of course, the legendary shoe collection of Imelda Marcos. <laughs> By the way, it's still there in Manila. So, if Manila, you can see the legendary shoe collection of Imelda Marcos. And she's back. She's, she's free. She's roaming around, attending social events and as if nothing happened. That's another problem with Filipinos. Culturally, we tend to forgive easily, which is actually good. It's part of our being Catholic, Christian. But we also tend to forget easily. So as if nothing happened. So the heroes of yesterday can be the heels of the day, the villains of the day, but tomorrow we'll all forget about it. Then we'll all just have fiesta, party, we'll sing the karaoke. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to that. <laughs> okay, so, as a result, we have this several conflicts happening through time. Uh, right now, there are only three remaining conflicts in the Philippines. First is the communist insurgency by the Communist Party of the Philippines and its armed component, the New People's Army, and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which is actually a breakaway group of an original uh, separatist movement in Mindanao called the Moro National Liberation Front, and a third group, which is actually the target of the United States in its so called war on terror the infamous Abu Sayyaf group, which is actually a group of terrorists responsible for a series of attacks and kidnapping in the land. Now, let me first uh, give you a background of the communist insurgency. The communist movement in the Philippines began during the 1930s as part of the emerging labor movement, trade union movement. The old Communist Party was known as the Partido Comunista ng Pilipinas, which is the Filipino translation of the Communist Party of the Philippines. Uh, it actually uh, it was declared illegal and outlawed, and it uh, waged an underground revolution even during the time of the Philippine Commonwealth period when we were still under the tutelage of the Americans. 
the communist insurgency was actually fueled. It was rooted in poverty. And it was nurtured in the agrarian unrest that resulted in farmers taking up arms in central Luzon or central Philippines during the 1940s and the 1950s. By the 1960s, the old communist movement has waned and some of its armed component has deteriorated into banditry. But at this time, and some of our professors here might remember, during the 60s, this was the time of a global student congress. And, uh, and this was the time of ideological fervor and ferment. And this was the time of Mao Zedong. And was this your time, Paul? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, it's not our time. We were too young back then. So, a new group of younger activists embraced the teachings of Mao Zedong and the Red Book. And a young professor at the State University of the Philippines reorganized the Communist Party in 1968 and relaunched it as the new Communist Party of the Philippines. A year later, he recruited a young guerrilla who is a member of the old armed component and in 1969 formed the new People's Army. The emergence of the Communist Party of the Philippines and the New People's Army was used by Marcos to justify his declaration of martial law in 1972, saying that there is this conspiracy of the left, of the communists, to overthrow the republic. Okay. Sounds familiar. It's like Star Wars. Okay. But what happened? when Marcos declared martial law, instead of vanquishing the communists, it fueled, it's like pouring gasoline on fire because of the repression, because of the human rights violation, because of the corruption that uh, spread not only in the civilian bureaucracy, but also in the military bureaucracy, people had no other choice and elections were rigged, First it was banned, and later on it was raped. Then people had no other choice but to take up arms against the dictatorship. Until we ousted him in 1986. So, through time, especially at the twilight, near the end of the Marcos regime, notice in this chart that the communists really gained strength hitting a record high of 25,000 members nationwide in the late 80s as a result of the Marcos dictatorship. Then after we have restored formal democracy, after we have ousted Marcos, they steadily declined and now they're not as strong as they used to be. But still, in a population of 100, almost, wait, Philippines is hitting almost 100 million, 94 million. In uh, 5 or 10 more years, we hit the 100 million mark. So, a little less than 6,000 armed rebels couldn't do much harm. But still, in terms of combatant strength, they can still do some damage because in terms of the economic costs of the conflict. So even if they, you know, they're, the percentage of the armed guerrillas is small compared to the entire population, the damage that they can do in terms of the economic costs is quite high. Now the other group is the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Now, the problem in Mindanao is somehow, well, somehow similar to the problem of Southern Thailand that we heard yesterday. It was a historical result of colonial incorporation of formerly autonomous peoples by the Spaniards and the Americans. Uh, 
had the Spaniards not arrived in the Philippines, we would have been like Malaysia. We would have been an Islamic country. Because there were already uh, several Islamic communities no, in, in, in the Philippines before it became the Philippines. But we were conquered by the cross and the sword in the Spaniards. But the areas near Mindanao, where the old Sultanate and the Datus, Muslim royalty, were never really conquered by the Spaniards. And the Americans, when they took over after uh, winning the Spanish-American War, and they were ceded to America after the Treaty of Paris, uh, what the American did was to approach Mindanao separately. So while consolidating their hold on the rest of the archipelago, they cut a different deal with the sultanates of Mindanao. And of course, the people of Mindanao, because of decades, centuries of animosity, with the Christians, the Catholics, especially under Spanish rule, found it better to deal with the Americans rather than the people from Manila. So, uh, throughout the entire uh, American colonial period, uh, the political infrastructure in Mindanao was quite different from the rest of the colony. So that when finally after the war and uh, Manila was in ruins because of the American liberation, they just left us. <laughs> okay, you're independent now. <laughs> so, the new republic was struggling. And uh, the elites in Manila this time had to deal with the Sultanate, but for a different reason. Uh, Mindanao, because of the different political setup, was feudal. A Sultan can just tell his people, vote for this candidate. Sometimes the entire electorate need not vote at all. <laughs> they will just you know, put one name. And in, in with one handwriting, just write all the okay, and vote for everyone. Okay. So Mindanao became a source of cheating or electoral fraud from the fifties onwards. In exchange, uh, the warlords of Mindanao were given special privileges, and this happened throughout, even during the time of the <coughs> So, and if you, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what happened uh, three years ago when an entire convoy of journalists were massacred by this warrior in Mindanao. And, you know, they just buried this journalist there, thinking that nobody, no one will notice that an entire caravan of journalists had been punished. That's how late that so it, 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 it is really an, a rule of terror of a different kind. Feudal, warlordism, bosses, and I'm sure some of you have an idea of how that can be. So, because of this, because of this, um, so many so many of the normal, regular citizens of Mindanao live impoverished, live in fear, lacking what we now term as human security. So, and seeing no other hope. And then we have all of these people from other parts of the country coming to Mindanao, taking over their land, then you have all this multinational company taking over their land. They had no other choice but to launch a movement, which originally was the 
uh, Bangsa Moro Independence Movement or the Mindanao Independence Movement. This was founded in the 1960s as an advocacy group. But later on, again, another young activist, a young Muslim professor, what's with this young Muslim, young professors, not in revolutions, what's this nonsense? <laughs> but it's a young professor from UP, University of the Philippines, who founded the Moro National Liberation Front. Then later on, and it will, it will wage a separatist struggle against uh, the Philippine government, and even during the time of the Marcos dictatorship. But there was a moment in during the Marcos dictatorship in which Marcos sent the beautiful Imelda to talk peace with the Moro National Liberation Front. And they traveled all the way to Libya to meet the great Muammar Gaddafi, who brokered the peace talks. And that became known as the Tripoli Agreement, in which Marcos promised to grant autonomy to several provinces in Mindanao, where the Muslims were coming. Why Bangsa Moro? Moro used to be an insult. It was a pejorative term to call Filipino Muslims. It came from the Spanish word for Moor. And if you know your world history, Spain was, certain parts of Spain was conquered by the Muslims, the Turks, the Moors. So that's why uh, the Spaniards you know, called the local Muslims Moro which is actually an insult. But the Filipino Muslim, instead of being ashamed of that label, embraced that and used that as their identity, the Bangsa Moro. Okay. Adam signal this is five more minutes and I still have so many, so many things to share, but okay. Um, in, in understanding politics, one of the key frame is that of the state okay, and its relationship with society. Sometimes we tend to think of it as either the state is strong and the society is weak or vice versa. But in reality, it is both. The state is only strong if society embraces it, if there is legitimacy. And Dr. Natisa has uh, shared his, her ideas on, on uh, legitimacy. And we tend to think of the state as one monolithic. We tend to ratify, give human characteristics to the state. But the state is actually a structure. It's a structure composed of people. And there are several levels or layers. So the people manning the state at the national level might not have the same interest as those manning the lower level or the local governments. <coughs> so we need to disaggregate the state. And if you're part of civil society, you identify who your friends, allies, and enemies are in the state. In the same way that the state, different levels of the state, should not look at civil society as one big monolithic group. So this is somehow similar to Anthony Giddens' uh, What's an uh, idea of uh, of uh, of that will come. Okay. So Anthony Giddens that the stru structuration theory. Okay. So structuration theory. The structures that allow people to act no, are at the very same time reproduced by the people structure the act. Okay? So, it goes back to that saying, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. If you want peace to be institutionalized, you should first act in a peaceful manner. And once that peaceful relationship is reproduced, it is institutionalized and it becomes part of the stuff. So that is structuration. 
the same way that if you democ if you want to democratize the state, you must first democratize society. If you want to strengthen the state, there should be legitimacy coming from society. So, this opens up what is known in the literature as the political opportunity structures. If you disaggregate the different components of state-society relationship, there will be external factors and internal factors. And if you look at these, uh, these movements, waging, uh, having conflict with the state, you must look at the internal dynamics of the movement, and then you must look at the domestic uh, environment occurring in the state, and the overall international, external, global environment. So for example, and I will not go into details for lack of time, um, the reason why Marcos was able to maintain his hold was because that was the height of the Cold War. And it was not just Marcos, it was other dictators in Thailand and Latin America. Because this was part of the overall foreign policy of the United States at the height of the Cold War in their fight against communism. So they found it to be part of their uh, own national interest to support dictatorships around the world to fight communism. Okay. So, we cannot simply say that the Philippine problem was unique to the Philippines. It was also a prob problem happening in other parts of the world, in Asia. So somehow, and then at that time, Maoism became popular because China was pushing for They were exporting their so that's what we call political opportunity structure. Another case in, case in point, um, the Philippines negotiated peace with the MNLF, but there was a split with the MILF, and then the MILF continued the struggle. Now, they were supposed to finally wage peace with the Philippine government, but what happened? 9-11. Then suddenly this, this separatist movement, which is not really a fundamentalist terrorist group, is now labeled together with the rest of the Al-Qaeda network. So it further complicate, complicated the, the process of this. So it's a combination of external, internal, domestic to the, to the movement, internal to the movement, domestic to the state, and events that are happening on the world. So what are the possible outcomes of the peace process if you try to analyze the relationship between them? So if, the, in terms of external, it's positive, you know, there's support, and the interna international environment is, you know, ripe for peace building, there's no conflict, and then internally the the movement is weak because of some debates, splits, whatever. Then peace accord and political incorporation is possible. But if, for example, you have Cold War, you have the war on terror, and then the movement is strong, then kiss, kiss your dream of finally solving the peace issue goodbye. And so on and so forth. So you have this, this schema, this model. Okay, so uh, in the original paper I wrote, uh, I mapped you know, the international process, the political opportunity structure, and the internal dynamics of the movement along five Marcos, Aquino, Ramos, Estrada, five presidencies. I will not discuss this with you because it's too detailed. But suffice it to say that 
through the five administration, the, the most feasible combination of all the variables did not emerge. There were moments in which we thought that it, it, this would be it, but it's not to be so. So now we are faced with the new administration. The previous administrations suffered from a crisis of legitimacy similar to what happened in Thailand. So its ability to negotiate with the rebels was severely weakened. But now that we've solved the legitimation crisis through a credible election that was accepted by everyone, even the losers, this president, President Benigno Aquino III, who is the son of the president that was installed after Marcos was ousted, the first woman president of Southeast Asia, Corazon Aquino, who is the widow of the slain opposition is Senator Benigno Aquino. Still a dynasty. So, but still a part of the political lands. But uh, there was an electoral mandate and there was legitimacy. And one of the first policy pronouncements of this president is to resume all negotiations. So with the international support, the Netherlands uh, was long supported as a third party negotiator. Uh, the talks with the Communist Party because uh, Jose Maria Sison, the leader of the movement, is exiled in the Netherlands. And then Malaysia has also been active uh, as a third party negotiator. And Japan has been very generous in supporting development projects in Mindanao. And just to show that uh, this administration is uh, sincere. It broke all protocol and met with the leaders of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front secretly in Narita Airport, <laughs> near Narita Airport in Japan, just to jumpstart the peace negotiation. But unfortunately, a few months later, uh, uh, conflict again erupted because of a split, splinter group, you know, a breakaway group. That's the problem, you negotiate with one, then they will split, then you will have to negotiate with another. But that's part of the challenges. But I'm happy to say that we have resumed negotiations. It's ongoing at this very moment while we're, we are here. Uh, the negotiations with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front is happening in, in, in Kuala Lumpur. And of course, uh, the same can be said about so there's guarded optimism. We're optimistic that it's guarded because uh, as history would show, uh, it's still the search for the perfect combination of variables that will bring peace finally to the Philippines. So these are part of the policy pronouncements. What are the lessons to be learned in the Philippine, continuing Philippine peace process? One, international factors may hinder, for example, the Cold War, the war there, or facilitate the end of Cold War, or the, the mediation of Norway in the peace negotiations. Then, the opening of domestic political opportunity structures. For example, the ouster of Marcos brought back democracy, formal democracy, so that was right for reconciliation. Uh, but this opportunity, these windows of opportunity are quick to close. Then the internal dynamics within the movement, within the communist movement and the Bangsamoro movement. And then the need to, for community participation. Building peace communities. And then dialogue and sectoral participation. In the negotiation, no secrets, no secret deal should be made because it should be open. Everyone should be open. Recommendation in the continuing negotiation, by the way, uh, 
in 2000, 2001-2003, I was a consultant to the uh, uh, peace, the government panel negotiating peace with the Communist Party of the Philippines. So more or less, I, I also have a first-hand uh, experience with the process of negotiating peace. So uh, that was actually why I wrote this paper. So this is an update of the paper I wrote out of that experience. Uh, encourage participation of international third party deviation and foster an attitude of flexibility. That's track one. Appreciate the role of internal third party participation, so civil society and uh, peaceful constitu constituencies instead of organized peace talks. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Uh, good evening to everyone. Thank you.